Okay, so I will move now to my second topic. Uh, <clears throat> and the big motivation is uh, more or less the same. It's again some attempt to look closer at what people did in psychology and see if we can, with our tools and uh, maybe better understanding of uh, the brain, uh, and see if we can also make some progress and contribute something to. To this field. So I'm now talking about uh, uh, a completely different type of memory, but you know, in the brain, everything is connected. So we can see very clearly how things are connected. Also, in this case, uh, in the memory recall. The nice thing about this paradigm is that, uh, again, there is a very clear and very quantitatively precise experiments that can be we can try to model and uh, understand. Uh, so long term. So I'm talking now about long term memory. This explicit memory we can where we can really say something explicitly what we remember. Uh, but again, even though this is a uh, one phenomenon, there are different processes that underlie this. And uh, <clears throat> uh, this is the one uh, review about uh, different memory phases from Yadin Dudai. Uh, but it's basically a very intuitive thing. You know, if you want to have information for the long term, you have to acquire it at certain moments. Then you have to maintain it, and then you have to be able to retrieve it, to recall. And uh, these processes, these three sub-processes uh, uh, have a very different nature. So again, and some of them are kind of explicit and conscious and some of them are not so explicit. So for example, uh, so this is like how we can really simplify it very much in a cartoonish way. So for example, when uh, what is acquisition? Acquisition means that you, when you, uh, again, it's easier to think about an example. So let's say you are listening to my lecture. Uh, again, an acquisition is something that we discussed basically an hour ago. So you have to understand the meaning, what, what I'm telling you and somehow to remember this. Right? So that's a, a very simple term. Uh, and this is an explicit process which requires your attention, right? You will not be able to do this if you are not motivated and if you are not focused on what I'm saying you, and if you are not thinking of something else that is more interesting. So that's uh, uh, one, uh, the first stage. But then imagine the situation that maybe sometime later, let's say when you get home or maybe a few years from now, somebody will ask you uh, to recollect about this school. And it may so happen that you will still remember uh, my lecture, not, at least not maybe some, some parts of this. So we have this you know, situation all the time. We can see a movie and then many years later, we can discover that we still remember this. So this is now completely outside of our control, right? We don't really pay any effort in order to remember something in this intervening uh, time, right? Which can be as long as years, can be very short. And we don't know really what, what happens then, and why certain things remain in memory and certain things disappear, right? Uh, and finally, uh, there is another phase, which is the actual retrieval. And again, we know that uh, sometimes, uh, obviously the information is uh, not maintained. There is no memory, you cannot retrieve it. So that presumably can happen. But uh, another thing that happened all the time is that we cannot actually recall things that we know that we remember. And again, it's not clear uh, there is no explicit uh, understanding. We don't really know uh, in advance, if you'll be able to retrieve something or not, and we put some effort, it takes a conscious effort, but it's of a very unclear nature. You don't really know what happens when you try to recall a certain thing. And it can fail a lot. 
So this is a framework that I want to uh, want you to keep things in, in, in inside this framework because it will make it easier for, for us to be on the same page when we discuss this process. And for now, I want to really focus on the uh, last uh, link of this process. So how do we, we recall things uh, that we remember, right? So this is a, uh, this is what I, I will mostly talk about uh, during this lecture. So how would you study this? So of course, uh, we can uh, study it in many ways and we can use different types of information for recall. I can ask you things about your past. I can ask uh, things about the books that you read, the movies that you watched some time ago. And people actually do all this. This is a very active uh, field of research. Uh, the problem is that it's hard to uh, really put a, a certain quantitative measure to, to recall in these situations, right? Because if you will uh, want to recall, let's say, my lecture uh, after a certain time, uh, it's really hard to say quantitatively how well you do, right? Of course, uh, you will never be able to repeat a single sentence the way I produced it. So you will. Misha. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Excuse me, please. We have uh, troubles with the sound. Could you uh, speak closer to microphone because okay. we can hardly hear you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, is it better now? Is it yes. better now? Better. Better now. Yeah. It's better now. Fine. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so the question is, uh, uh, the problem is I forgot what, <laughs> what I was talking about. Uh, uh, the question is how to, uh, if we want to do some uh, theory of uh, recall, we need to quantify, that's a, a obvious uh, necessary step. And with the realistic information like lectures, movies, uh, uh, books, it's really hard to put a quantitative measure, to put up a quantitative measure, because you will never uh, recall information in the same form as you acquire it. So you will, it will undergo a lot of processing and uh, generalization in your brain, the more time goes by. And so to give a number, it will be very non-trivial, right? If you, let's say 10 years uh, from here, from now, you will just recall very vaguely about what I, presented during this lecture, it will, not, it will be very difficult to come up with a number. So psychologists came up with uh, paradigms that allow you to circumvent this problem. So at, at the expense of the information itself being much more primitive than in real life. So one example is uh, a, a classical example is uh, to work with a list of random words, right? So something like this, you have a, uh, uh, could be words, could be something else, but let, let's think about a list of words which are randomly selected. And so there is no uh, message that they actually convey, right? So there would be a list, could be a short list, could be a long list, but in any case, because we create these words, uh, just picking them by chance from some uh, database, uh, there is no real me message that they convey. So when you remember this list, you can only remember every word as, as it is uh, in the list, right? Whether it's in the list or not, but you, you, you don't really, you cannot make, make some story out of these words, unless you're really very imaginative and some people actually do, but for most of the people, they perceive this as a completely meaningless uh, uh, set of words. Uh, and then you can ask, uh, well, uh, just try to recall as many of, of the words as you so the advantage of this is that you can very easily quantify your performance. Right? So you can just uh, count how many words you recall. Okay, there is a price that you pay that the information is meaningless. So it's maybe not very interesting task and very rarely in real life that we have to do this. Sometimes we have to do this uh, when we have to just recall a list of things that are not really related to each other. Uh, but uh, the big advantage is that you can uh, uh, make experiments very precise and, and quantify the results very well. And there were a lot of experiments like that done uh, in, uh, by cognitive psychologists in, 
usually uh, uh, mostly over the last century, but even before that. Uh, and, and that's a, a nice thing, right? We have a, a collection of results, very large collection of results. We can do experiments ourselves. These experiments are, of course, very easy to do. You don't need to have a specialized lab. There are no recordings. Uh, the question is, can we really predict something about uh, these experiments? Uh, So what we know from the literature is that, uh, uh, if you go back, is that uh, there are several key observations. And I, I think the, 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 the most important observation, at least for as far as I'm concerned, is that um, if the list becomes long enough, quite long, so if the list is very short, like one, two, three words, four words, obviously it's very easy to remember. So people, and it's easy because we just, recall them from our working memory and usually people recall them in the same order as they are presented and there is no effort put into this what happens if the list becomes longer and potentially much longer is that the whole pattern of recall completely changes so people uh, cannot recall them in the correct order they usually start from the end which means that they start recall from the working memory of few words in the end of the list but then they start, uh, it becomes much more difficult. They uh, can jump back and forth over the list. They don't really remember in which order the words were presented. And they recall only a very small fraction of the words in the list. The, the longer the list becomes, the fewer words people can recall, even if you give them long time, right? So even if they really try hard, the fraction of the words that people can recall uh, becomes uh, less. So if I would be doing giving this lecture in the class, I would do experiment on you. And this is always very entertaining and people immediately uh, see that the, the task becomes very, very difficult, even for the lists of very moderate length. So usually in the class, I give a list of 16, 20 words and people discover that they cannot really remember most of them. Okay, so this was uh, this is a, a key result that people get, and the gap becomes bigger and bigger. So the longer the list is, the fewer words, the fewer fraction of the words, the, the smaller is the fraction of the words that people can recall. Even though the number of words that you can recall is growing on the average, so there is no sharp limit. It's not like a working memory uh, limit, which is just a, a single number. There is no single number, but the the number is increasing slowly with the number of words in the list. So these are some compilation of very old results. So here I show you L stands of the total number of words in the list. And here there are two uh, measures. One is R, which is how many words people can recall. And then there is another measure M, and I will go back to it later, but here just uh, means how many, some estimate of how many words from the list people remember at the end of presentation. Right? That's very important because you, you cannot remember all the words uh, if they're presented to you in a, in a fast, uh, with a fast speed. Okay, so this is a logarithmic plot. So you see that uh, uh, when the list become longer and longer, like up, up to a few hundreds, uh, there is a big gap. You, you cannot recall more than roughly 10 or 20, 30 words at, at most, even though you remember many more. You, you can remember hundreds of words. I'll just, at, at this moment, you just have to take my word for it and I'll show you later how you estimate this uh, measure, but only a small fraction of these words you can. And the main task of, uh, of the project that I'm, I want to, to share you with you is uh, uh, whether you can explain this uh, gap and whether you can quantitatively predict from some uh, hypothetical uh, processes uh, how many words you can recall. Okay, so this is the, uh, the formulation of the task of a problem that I want to address. If you have any questions about uh, the problem, let's see if there are some. Questions here. Okay, so 
people hear me well. That's a good news. Uh, okay, so let's try to come up with some ideas about how recall works. So, okay, so now uh, this is a process. So I'm not the, the nature of the model that I'm going now to present to you is very different from the ones that I showed you last uh, uh, lecture and, and, and as mo most of the models in theoretical neuroscience are. Most of the models in theoretical neuroscience are models of dynamical systems. So you are assuming some uh, something, uh, some processes in the brain which are dynamical processes and you're writing down equations with corresponding parameters. So here, I, 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 you will see that the model that I will uh, propose for this process is of a different nature. It's kind of an algorithm. It's more like a alg algorithmic uh, set of alg algorithmic set of steps that I assume brain performs in order to uh, recall the words. Uh, my main prob uh, framework is again uh, Hopfield model, so I, I, I don't uh, have to spend too much time on this. So again, I'm assuming that you have a network where the, the words are encoded. So every word has an enco uh, is encoded by a certain number of uh, words, a certain number of neurons. Uh, and now there is a crucial difference is that I'm now not neglecting the overlaps be between this a representation because I think the overlaps here is the main uh, feature of, of this uh, process. So we need to take uh, to, to take into account that the, there are neurons that may encode different neuro, uh, multiple uh, words at once. Okay, so now uh, and again we I, I assume that these are sparse random representations as in the whole world. Uh, so how would I? Uh, so how do you? Uh, how do I assume uh, the process works? So what is the algorithm? So I'm I'm just proposing a very concrete, a simple algorithm of what happens in our brain when we try to recall the list of words. And presumably this is a more general, but for now let's just focus on this particular uh, paradigm. So I'm saying the first thing you do is uh, after you hear the list of words, you recall one of the words that is still uh, in your working memory, right? And typically this will be one of the words which are at the, at the very end of the list. So let's say this is the, uh, let's say this is the, this uh, big blue circle uh, illustrates this word that you recall the first. Uh, now, uh, the hypothesis is that every time you have a, a certain word that you, you recall or retrieve from your memory, you use this word as a trigger uh, to recall a subsequent word, right? because there is no, <clears throat> no other trigger for you except for your memory. <clears throat> I'm assuming that you are using uh, every word that you are currently, uh, you just currently recall to, in order to trigger the recall of the next word. Uh, how do you choose the next word? Uh, well, we did some simulations uh, in the Hopfield model where we realized these processes, how the network, we extended it to, uh, uh, we added some mechanism that allows the network to make transitions from uh, these uh, uh, attractors or encodings. And then based on this simulation, so we just noticed that typically the transition happens to the representation that had the largest overlap uh, with the previous one. So that's a very clear and intuitive uh, observation that whenever you have a uh, you you have an attractor, a certain uh, reactivation of a certain neurons, the next one that will be uh, reactivated is the one that has the largest overlap. Okay, so in this case, uh, this will be. Uh, uh, the transition will, will go this way, right? So this is based on this uh, overlap, matrix of overlaps between uh, between these encodings that is mathematically just determined by the uh, scalar product. Th these are binary zero one uh, vectors that represent the encodings of individual 
uh, memory items. And then if you just take a scalar product and some of, so this is a summation of all of the neurons, this will tell you how many neurons there are that are encoding uh, both of these uh, items. Uh, and then uh, if you recall a certain uh, item now, so then the next one will be chosen as the maximum of the corresponding uh, uh, set of uh, overlaps. So we can call this matrix uh, similarity matrix just to, for the future, because this, in my view, this is a reflection of how similar uh, the, the, the words are. <clears throat> okay, so then what happens next? So you can see already from, from this uh, drawing that if you would then uh, continue this process, so you would just go back uh, to the original word, and then you would just uh, jump back and forth, right? So this is obviously this model would have a very uh, terrible performance, right? Because this would typically recall just two words and then get immediately stuck in this uh, uh, back and forth. So we are uh, adding uh, one extra uh, constraint to this thing. We are saying that uh, if you make a transition from one item to another one, you cannot immediately, you cannot go back, right? So if you're now searching for the next item to retrieve, uh, you don't consider this one that is just retrieved uh, before that, right? So this is, there is some mechanism of suppression of this item that does not allow you to go back. Okay, so this, uh, this prevents uh, this algorithm to very quickly get stuck into this uh, loop of two items. And so this will now explore, has to explore then other words. And in this case, uh, there are only two words left. So it will just look at these two words and then it will choose uh, this lower one, right? Because this has some overlap and this one doesn't have overlap this word again. So this will be suppressed, uh, forbidden, and then you will go here. The same uh, thing will happen again here. You cannot go back immediately here, so you will complete this uh, cycle of three. Uh, you'll go back to this word, and now you just continue cycling, right? So in this situation, uh, you can see how uh, you have four words in your memory after the presentation, uh, but out of these four words, uh, it just happens that you only recall three. And, 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 and you will never recall. The important point here is that these three items kind of shield, uh, have like, are, are acting like a shield that does not allow this process to ever uh, retrieve this remaining one, right? No matter how long you wait now. And this reflects very well the the experience of people who are trying to do recall of the word, you recall a certain number of words and then the same words will come to your mind. And no matter how long you try, uh, you cannot recall any more words. So usually people just give up after, after a few attempts. Even though occasion, occasionally they can still recall new words, but uh, for most part, the moment people get stuck, they, they cannot recall any more words. So this is the uh, idea. This is the suggestion that we make, uh, which is a very simple one. So advantage is that this, uh, after we formulate the model in this way, there is basically the complete, this is a complete description. So we can then uh, uh, do, analyze this model to uh, mathematically just the, the limit is only our ability to do the math on this model, but nothing else. Uh, and the question is, how do you really know that whether this idea is right or whether it's wrong, whether it's completely wrong or whether it captures something? Uh, uh, so here, it's actually the advantage of using this algorithmic model is that you can come up with a very precise prediction about the results of the experiment without having any parameters that you can choose. And this is a, actually an advantage in this case because the because this is a, such a high level model of the process that it would be very difficult to constrain the parameters from some observation, right? We don't really know uh, how words are encoded in the brain, how many neurons 
are encoding very each word. This is a all very abstract kind of hypothesis, and most of the people would uh, say that this is probably uh, reasonable assumptions, but there is no way you can actually say something more precise, whether it's uh, random encodings, uh, sparse encodings, etc. So uh, having a model with a large number of parameters would, would not be very useful in order to say, uh, to, to try to predict the date, because this would be you could have a very big spread of possible behaviors. If you have a model like that, that I just introduced, which is more algorithmic uh, type, there is not much freedom that you have. So in particular, in the model that, as I, as I introduced to you, there is only one parameter that you can play with, which is the, the sparseness of representation and nothing else, right? So the model is completely almost parameter free. So this means that if we manage to uh, solve the model and get some predictions, this has to be uh, can be potentially have to be precisely confirmed. Otherwise, uh, the model can be faulted, which is also I think a very big advantage here. <coughs> so what I want to show you now is some math. So so we I had three basically I had three pieces in this. Uh, uh, presentation, I, I gave you some introduction, introduced the problem, so some psychological introduction, some results. I will uh, also introduce the model, maybe four pieces in the talk. Then now I will show you, there will be some mathematical part, and I want you to like bear with me about the math. You don't have to really understand all the derivations, but at least so that you can uh, appreciate the a result of the mathematical part. And then I will show you some new experiments that we did in order to test the predictions of the model. <clears throat> okay, so this uh, some preview, and then I don't know exactly when I started, so I'm not sure how much time I still have, but probably around an hour. Okay, so this is uh, again to help you understand uh, how the model works. So we have this uh, matrix of similarities. And uh, what I need to know about this matrix, uh, so I assume that this is uh, this matrix is generated by this random encoding size, right? So this is generated in this way, as, as, as shown in this equation. Uh, however, in order to generate this uh, recall uh, sequence, I don't really need to know the whole matrix. What I really need to know is that uh, I need to know within each row, I need to know where the maximal element is, and I put a black spot on the maximal element, and where the next maximal, second maximal element is, and I, and I put the red spot. In. So all I need to know uh, about this matrix uh, is I have to put a red, black and red spot at each row. Okay, so so what do I do then? Uh, I have these uh, spots, uh, and and I, I do the I I, I now generate the graph, the trajectory, the recall trajectory on the graph. How do I do this? In a certain way, in the following way. I uh, let's say my, the first word that I recall is the word number one. So the number here just tells nothing. It's just the word that I begin my process with. So from word number one, I look for the position of the, uh, all I need to know is where the maximal element in the first row of the matrix is. So this will be position 14. So I put an arrow, a, a black arrow to the element 14. From every, uh, from every element, from every node in the graph, I have two arrows. I have a black arrow, which points to the position of the black spot in the row and the red arrow, which point to the position of the red spot. So in this case, you have a black arrow going to 14 and a red arrow going into 13. So when I start my process, I always, I always uh, take the black arrow if I can. So this is a preferred arrow. I make a transition. So I say the next word that will be recalled will be the word number 14. So what happens next? I have to go back. I have to go to the row 14. 
and I have to see where the black spot is. The black spot is on, in the first position. This means that the black arrow from 14 would go back to one. I don't consider this. This arrow is at this step forbidden. So I, have, I, I look at the position of the red spot where the red arrow is and I go to uh, a node number 10. So the next word will be 10. Then I repeat the process, I go to 10. From 10, I take a red uh, arrow to seven. From seven, I, I, I take a red uh, arrow to six. And I always take a red arrow because the black uh, arrow would bring me back to where I come from. From six, I can take a, a, a black arrow to 12. You see from six, there is a 12 position of that black. So I continue. Uh, this process. So sometimes I follow the red arrow and sometimes I follow uh, the red arrow, depending on, on, on this circumstance of where the black arrow takes. So I always first consider the black arrow. And then if it's uh, not allowed, sorry, I take a red one. So what can happen? So at some point, I will always uh, collide with a node that I already recall, right? So in this case, this happens uh this is the first time that it can happen here uh i will go from 16 back to the 10 that i already uh, visited before so what happens then uh so now i go back to 10 and now i just continue so again continuing means that you can you consider the arrows that uh, originate from node 10 and again there is a black arrow and the red arrow so in this case, what happened? So the, the, one of the two possibilities could happen. One possibility would be that uh, the black arrow from 10 would go again to the same node as before. So this would mean, this would have happened if the arrow from 10 to seven was uh, black to begin with. And in this case, I would immediately start uh, circling over this uh, loop and would not recall any word, uh, any new word. Okay, so I hope it's clear, but it's not then ask me because this is really uh, a main aspect of the model that uh, I need you to to understand because uh, this is what's uh, important for the rest of my presentation. Okay, so if this arrow, original arrow was uh, black, I would just do the same uh, uh, transition again, and then all the, uh, future would just repeat. So I would just continuously circle onto this. This is not the case for this particular graph because in this particular realization, the original arrow was red and the black arrow was going to the uh, node 14 that I could not take uh, back uh, at, the, at the first time when I was here. But now uh, my algorithm can perfectly choose the 14th, uh, 14th node. So now, I'm not uh, going into the loop. I'm actually go start going in the opposite direction from the first uh, trial, so for, from the first trajectory. So I go and retrieve node number 14, the node that I already retrieved. Then I will look at node number 14. I, I follow the black arrow. I will go back, uh, sorry, that uh, to word number one that I started with. And now from word number one, uh, again, the black arrow is now cannot be taken. So I, I choose the red arrow and then I start a new uh, trajectory. So I recall a, a word that I didn't recall before. In this case, this will be a word number 13. Okay, so this is another possibility that can happen is that after collision, you make few steps back and then you start recalling a new trajectory. So you have a new word, 13, then you follow to word number five. Again, you take some, uh, you go uh, red, uh, sequence of red and black arrows until uh, again, you collide with the node 12 that you already uh, retrieved before. And now you are in the situation that I described to you before where you do the same transition for the second time, right? First time you came to 12, you went to 16. And now the second time you again go to 16. After you make this transition for the second time, you are sure, you can be sure that all the future trajectory will just repeat, exactly repeat. 
right? Because there will be no difference between the second uh, instance of this trajectory and the first instance. So beginning from this uh, situation, you will not recall any new words. You will just repeat uh, this uh, path and this will be your final loop, right? So your final loop will include nodes number 12, 16, 10, 14, 1, 13, 5, 11, 12 again. Okay, so this is the, uh, this is the trajectory that I have, and this is uniquely determined by, uh, sorry, by the similarity matrix that I have and by the, the original point of my project, right? So knowing this matrix and moreover, as I said, you don't really need to know the elements of the matrix. All you need to know is where these black and red spots in each row are. So having these positions of the black and red spots and uh, choosing the original point in this uh, uh, recall, you can uniquely determine the sequence of the subsequent uh, recall. And of course, you can predict the total number of words that you can recall. In this case, you can count uh, how many words you recall. And there are, will be other words, like words number two, three, four, eight, nine, 15. Uh, so six words out of 16 words will never be recalled. So the, in this uh, example, out of the uh, list of 16 words, uh, the, this uh, model recalls uh, 10 and will not rec uh, recall six. Of course, this number 10 is not uniquely predicted. Uh, it's uniquely predicted by the matrix, but if you don't know anything about the matrix, so if you just uh, have some uh, statistics of this matrix, then of course you cannot uniquely predict uh, neither the sequence, you, you cannot predict anything about this experiment. So you don't know what the sequence of the retrievals will be and how many words you recall. Uh, but that's what we also not hoping to, to, to predict because obviously different people will recall different words and in different uh, order, a different number of words. What we can hope to, re to predict is how many words on average or the statistics, the, the probabilistic structure of this process. So how many, the questions that are, is, are legitimate to ask is, for example, how many words on average people can recall out of, let's say, 16 words that they remember. That's one question, or you can ask even uh, higher level questions like what's the variance, how, how the distribution of this uh, process is looking. Okay, so this is the, uh, the mathematical question. Uh, and everything here is now defined precisely well. So there is a certain answer, right? The question is whether we can derive the answer is uh, just a question about the, the mathematics, but, uh, uh, Theoretically, the model is well defined, so there, there is a certain answer for every M and for every uh, parameter which characterize the encoding, you can, uh, the answer to this problem exists in a, in a precise way. Uh, it's not an easy problem to solve, right? It's a very easy problem to, to lay out, uh, to, to make these drawings is a very, is the thing to do to come up with the mathematical answer is much more difficult because uh, you see this is a quite complex uh, uh, process here. It can have it can have collisions, it can have uh, go through the same nodes uh, several times. In this case, there is a uh, there are only uh, two loops basically, but you can imagine a situation where there could be more loops. Uh, so to come up with an exact uh, uh, exact solution to this model is quite easy. Also, the statistics of the matrix is quite complicated because different elements of this matrix are not uh, exactly independent from each other. So that's, uh, I, uh, at least I don't know how to solve the, this uh, model in the, in the general form, but we, we managed to find a very interesting uh, asymptotic case where the model can be solved exactly. And this is turns out to be the most interesting limiting case. So let me show you, have, give you some idea about how the, this, uh, uh, how this model can be solved. So the, the, the way we did it is, was in two steps. 
one step we simplified it again. So we say, let's assume that your matrix that you have uh, is uh, completely random and uh, not symmetric. This matrix is necessarily by construction is symmetric because this is the uh, scalar product of two vectors. And this generates this uh, complications in the, uh, in, in the trajectory. So let's get rid of all of this complication. Let's say, imagine that this similarity matrix would have been just completely random uh, asymmetric matrix. So it means that every element would be chosen independently on all the rest. Uh, so this is a very simple problem. This makes the, the, and then just use the same algorithm. In this case, you don't really need to distinguish between red and, and uh, black. So let's just uh, on, only choose the black arrow all the time because the chance to have this loop would then be very small. Uh, so this model can be solved exactly, practically exactly. Uh, and uh, the, the reason it can be solved exactly is that now uh, all the transitions have exactly the same probability, right? So now this graph uh, has, a, has a very simple uh, generative structure. You can just say, let's take a certain number of nodes and let's put an arrow from each node to a randomly chosen target, right? And this will be our graph. And so there are no correlation. There's no uh, no colors, and uh, every uh, every two nodes have the, exactly the same probability to be connected by an arrow uh, uh, as any other node. So the probability that an arrow from a given node will point to a particular node will always be given by just one divided by the number of total number of nodes uh, in the graph. So this makes the problem uh, easy because this, this allows you to write down exactly the expression for the probability that you will uh, retrieve R nodes before uh, colliding, right? And every collision would then mean that this the process goes into the circle, right? So let's say you retrieve R nodes then you back, go back, collide with the node number two, and then you will just uh, uh, repeat this same sequence again and again. So all, all that matters here is how long uh, it will take you to 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 have a to see a few uh, a first collection a co collision. And again, this is a random quantity, but you can write the very simple and exact uh, pro, uh, expression for the probability to have exactly R nodes. What is the chance to have R nodes? Well, it's easy because every time to have a particular uh, collision from a particular node R to particular node, let's say two is just one over M minus one. M is the total number of nodes in the network. So uh, as time, as you rec uh, retrieve more and more nodes, there are more and more possibilities to get the collision, right? Because if you retrieve R nodes, there are R minus one chances for you to make a collision to go back and so when you uh, increase r you have to uh, subtract this probability uh, to have a collision so this will be first one minus one over m one minus two over m etc until you get to r minus one and then at this moment uh, you you make a collision, right? So in the, the, there is a small mistake here. So this should be R minus one here again. So the chance to have a collision after you uh, compute R, after you already retrieve R nodes will be given by approximately R of one. So this is an exact equation, right? You don't need to make any approximation to write this down. This is true if we have this uh, random graph. Uh, the only problem is that this is not very uh, clear to how to manipulate this equation. So for, for example, if you want to know uh, what the average number of words that you can retrieve, it's not necessarily easy to do, right? You have to <coughs> calculate some complicated uh, uh, series to, to summate. Uh, which can be done. I show you some of the results later, but you can simplify this even more if you consider only the long list. So we are not 
really interested in the list of like very few words, two, three, four. Uh, interesting question is what happens when the number of words in the list is quite long. So we can assume that M is a large number and then we can also kind of guess and then confirm at the end that the number of words that you typically can recall is will be much less than M. And this is what experimental results also show, but I will show you that it's also mathematically uh, follows from the model, but still a large number. So given that we uh, assume that R is always much less than M, you can simplify this equation because you can, every uh, bracket here can be uh, replaced by the exponent, right? So one minus a small number can be replaced by the exponent of minus this small number. And so now you have a product of these exponents, which can be uh, calculated as the exponent of the sum. So you have a, a exponent of the, here there will be arithmetic progression, like sum of one plus two up to R divided by M. So this will be this uh, product of these brackets. And then this factor R over M. So I'm neglecting now all this minus ones. So this arithmetic progression can be taken precisely. This is given by R square over two. So you have a, a much more intuitive uh, expression for the probability to retrieve a certain number of uh, items R out of a uh, total number of items M that you remember. So this is now much easier to manipulate and do the calculation with. So in particular, if we uh, introduce the new variable X, which is a rescaled value of R with the square root of M. So if you denote the new variable X, just R divided by square root of M, then the probability distribution for X will be completely universal function, does not depend on M. You can clearly see this. Okay, so this is a very simple uh, probability distribution of X. You can find all the statistics of X, the first moment, second moment, etc. So in particular, the average value of X is given by square root of pi over two. So if you uh, go back to R, so this predicts that the average value of R that you can get in this model will be a square root of pi over two times X. So very simple uh, uh, expression. And this justifies a priori our assumption that R will be much less than M, right? If M is a big number, then indeed R is much less than M, much bigger than one, so it's somewhere in between. So we have a very simple and generic explanation for why uh, the number of words that you can recall in the long list will always be a small fraction. And moreover, we have a very precise functional uh, form of this uh, relation up to a, up to a quotation. So here there is no parameters to tune, right? Everything. It's just the moment we make this assumption that the matrix, uh, the similarity matrix is completely random, we have a unique prediction uh, for the retrieval of the matrix. Now, this is not our model. As I said, this is a, a kind of a, a simplification of our model, which is by itself, I guess, a huge simplification. Uh, and also, I can tell you that there are also some uh, more precise results, but uh, maybe. Uh, I'm not sure this will be uh, relevant for my talk, but th there are some more exact results even than for this model than what I show you. In particular, you can write down the more precise expression for the first moment, and there is an exact relation between the second and the first moment at this point. But for now, this is not really maybe important. Okay, so now, uh, so. The next step, so this was the first step to solve this simplified model. The next step is that we can actually relate, we can use this uh, solution in order to get some uh, idea about the full model. So how does the full model, the full matrix differ from the random matrix? It, it differs in two forms. First, uh, our matrix is symmetric. Uh, and second, there, there is this issue of red and uh, and uh, red and black arrows, uh, which is not uh, present in the, in the simple model. So we can uh, now take 
uh, if you consider the very limit of the very sparse encoding in the model, that's the only uh, complication that we now have to take into account. So you can show uh, that if we consider sparse encoding, all the other correlations can be neglected. So we can uh, consider the matrix, which is fully random uh, matrix, but it's uh, symmetric. So you uh, have a, uh, just uh, the independent degrees of freedom are just one uh, triangle. Uh, within this matrix and we have uh, we need to keep track of the uh, largest and the second largest elements in the, each matrix to generate the heterogeneity. So it turns out that this is a as I said this makes the model much more complicated because the trajectories are more complicated you need keep to keep track of two colors but it turns out that you can reduce it uh, to the original model with some sub substitutions. So what are the substitutions? So we have to uh, do two observations. And, and these are all co purely combinatorical calculations. So I'll just show you the result, but uh, those who are interested can go and, and uh, uh, read the, in, the, in the paper how you derive it. So first we need to, if you go back to this uh, graph, we need to calculate what's the probability uh, to go, uh, uh, to, to have a collision uh, from this uh, uh, from this node to one particular node that was already retrieved in the past. In the, in the random model, this was uh, one over n, right? Because all the errors had exactly the same probability. Uh, here it turns out that uh, the probability to make this collision uh, is not one over m, but rather one over two m. So why why this uh, two comes about? So why the probability to go from node number 16 to node number 10 is twice is two times less than just a, a priori probability to go from a node to some other random node and the, this comes about because we have to take into account that when you were visiting the node 10 in the first place you did not uh, retrieve the node 16 all right so this element the uh, the element in the matrix uh, between 10 and 16, so this particular value of the matrix, was not the large large enough so that to cause the transition from 10 to 16. So these words are not not too close to each other, and this it turns out that this reduces the probability uh, that you will pick that word number 10 after word number 16 by by a factor. Of okay, so this is a simple. Combinatorical uh, calculation that I would, don't want to uh, hear, but it's quite easy. And then I said we need to take another factor into account: is that after you go back to ten, sometimes you continue going in the same direction, and sometimes you go back. So what is the probability? And only if you go in the same direction, the the process will stop here. Right, so this means that the probability, uh, uh, so what is the probability that this situation happens? And again, there is some combinatorical calculation that uh, shows that this uh, probability is uh, two thirds, right? So with probability two thirds, you will uh, go into the cycle immediately after the first collision. And only with probability one third, uh, you will do what what is in this what you see in this example with this graph so if you now multiply these two factors uh, this tells you what is the probability that after uh, uh, that having a, a certain uh, node retrieved now that you'll go back to a particular node uh, in this case 10 and this will end the recall this will be given by a product of these two numbers, uh, which is one over three. Okay, so with the probability which is complementary to this, you will recall few, uh, some extra words. So this may happen either because you are not doing this recall, uh, collision or you do a collision, but you go in the opposite direction. So this is what uh, you see that there is one over three M and this factor of three is, uh, a difference that we have between this model and the previous one. So this indicates that in terms of the uh, statistics of how long these trajectories are, 
this model should behave in the same way as a random model, except that we have to substitute this extra uh, factor of three uh, in the expression, right? So we need to uh, take this model, substitute m by three m. And as a result, we have this extremely uh, simple prediction, right? We say that if we have a, a m words in memory, and they encode it in this way, in the random uh, sparse way. And the recall process works according to the algorithm that I suggested. Uh, then we can predict that the number of words that people can recall will be given by this uh, simple expression. Okay, so this will scale as a square root of the total number of words that you remember with the very specific value of the coefficient, which is roughly two. Okay, so let's say, let's predict that if you remember 100 words, on average, if you try to recall, you will only recall 20 and then you get stuck. Right? And, and you will not recall 80 words. Uh, that's quite a... Uh, an amazing thing, and, and especially in psychology, you can say this is a really a huge overkill, right? How can you ever uh, have such, such a precise prediction for a psychological process? Right? Because obviously, uh, you know, it cannot work this way. There will be a lot of factors that we probably didn't take into account that will uh, make the behavior much more variable than this predicts. Uh, Okay, so this is just, uh, this shows that if you do the numerical simulation of the model, then this, this uh, analytical expression indeed works very well. So if you go to the very sparse limit of the model, the behavior approaches this uh, predicted line, square root three pi over two. But there is a, this issue, right? And the, the big problem is that the recall performance is really not as universal as this model would uh, predict, right? Because there are many things. First of all, the way you do experiments already determines how many words people recall. You can do many manipulations. The most obvious manipulation is manipulating the speed of the of the presentation. If I present you the words uh, with a high speed, people can uh, recall fewer uh, fewer words than if uh, we recall if if we present with a low speed. Also, it's well known that uh, people who are older uh, recall fewer words in the same condition, under the same condition, recall fewer words than younger people. So how would, so this would make the whole exercise completely meaningless because this would mean that uh, there is no simple equation that it, at least it has to, to take into account a lot of other variables that we really didn't take into account. So how, how, how can this be still a useful thing? Uh, and the crucial uh, idea here is that we are relating, we, we have this variable M, that is, we say the number of words that people remember after the presentation of the list. So this is not the same as the total number of words in the list. So the possibility that we have to explore is that all of these manipulations or all of these factors that we didn't take into account, uh, they actually affect uh, the acquisition part of the process. So, for example, uh, if you compare young people with old people, then old people remember fewer words than the young people. Or if you uh, do the, the experiment with a faster presentation speed, then people remember fewer words than if you do a slower presentation speed. All of these are quite obvious assumptions. Uh, so they are qualitatively very clear assumptions, but the question is, can it really uh, quantitatively uh, fit into this predicted thing? So in order then to do uh, the experimental test of this uh, prediction, we would need to have a way uh, to experimentally measure both, both of these uh, variables, right? So we would have to somehow know how many words uh, people remember how many words they recall and see if this relation uh, has a universal feature. So this would mean that it would be valid 
no matter which manipulations uh, you do over the experiments, and no matter how, what are the subjects that you uh, take for your study. Okay, so I, I hope that this is a, this is the right way, uh, or the only way that we can uh, test uh, this kind of theories that I present. So now I want to uh, switch gears. So uh, we have this uh, nice prediction. So I want to uh, share with you the experiments that we did in order to uh, test the pre these predictions. And, and then the main problem now is how do we estimate that? So we can uh, think that, uh, you know, if I give you, a, uh, if I present a, a long list of words to you with a high speed, obviously you will not remember all of them for, for many reasons, right? You can uh, not pay attention to a word, you can get tired, you can, maybe words can also interfere with each other and some words can erase other words from memory. Uh, and uh, for now, uh, how do you how do you measure this uh, uh, empirically, right? So we, we want to design a way to measure this n, and there is actually not a, a, an obvious way to do it, right? Because uh, uh, a simple idea would be just to ask you, right? I would ask, you, I would give a, uh, I would show you a word and ask, do you remember or not? But this is not a a very reliable a way of doing an experiment because uh, people, uh, you know, you may not, you you may be uncertain, right? And then you will have to make some decision about whether if you are uncertain about whether what was in the list or not, some people will tend to say yes, some people will tend to say no. Uh, so it's not very easy. So the, another idea is to do a, a kind of recognition experiment, but in a different way. So to present uh, a word from, from the list, like let's say I take a picker word creature from the list, and then I take another random word. Uh, and then I ask you uh, which one of these two words was in the list. So now this kind of normalizes this tendency of different people to say yes or no, because you are not saying yes or no to a particular word. You have to pick a word. The idea is that if you remember which word was in the list, you will give a correct answer. And then if you don't remember, you just have two words that you will look new to you, and then you will give a random answer. Okay, so this is the main idea that was uh, proposed a uh, long time ago. It has some weaknesses uh, because uh, so at the beginning we were not really thinking that this will work because you can think about uh, if you are just you are not really uh, you don't really remember that the word creature was in the list but you remember that it was something let's say that that is like like kind of an animal or something that is a, a small living being. And then you have two words, creature and monument, and then you may say, okay, I, I'll probably, it, will, it was probably a creature, right? So this is a, was a, our concern that this uh, uh, procedure may overestimate the number of words that you remember, but we, we didn't know really how serious this uh, uh, issue. So we just decided to try it anyway. And, and especially because this was tried by people before and this is considered to be by some people as, as a legitimate uh, procedure. So how would you then uh, do the calculation? So I would say, then you say, let's, let's have a list of words and let's, uh, just choose a word by chance and uh, uh, give a, a, a destructor. So what is the probability for you to give a correct answer? What's the, the chance to for correct recognition? Well, it's easy because I say, if this word is one of the words that you remember, then you will give a correct answer. And the chance that for this is M over L, right? You remember M words, you, ch you pick a random word that they choose the, ch the, the chance that this will be a remembered word is M over L. Losing, yeah. So the chance is M over L. If you pick a word that you don't remember, so then you'll give a random answer. So the chance to have a correct answer will be one half. 
So that's a very easy uh, algebra. And then you invert this. And then you can recalculate uh, the number of words that you remember from this simple equation. And so if, let's say, if you don't remember any words, then you'll just guess. So C will be one half. And if you remember all the words, you will give uh, all correct answers, and then C will be uh, one. Okay, there are some technical issues because how many questions you are allowed to ask? It turns out that uh, if you ask several questions, then this, there is an interference problem. So the very clean way to do the experiment is only ask one question and to compensate this uh, to collect the data by having a large population of people. So we have now a group of people that are doing this experiment and then we, uh, each person, uh, sees a list of words, we ask him a question, we write down whether he gave a correct or not correct answer, we calculate the, the C for the, whole, for the whole group of people, and then we have a, an estimate for the number of words on average uh, in this population of people that uh, they, uh, they remember. Uh, and then we do a recall experiment on the same people under the same condition with different lists. And then we just count how many words uh, uh, people recall. And then we have these two numbers. These are all random numbers. So we'll have to average R and average M uh, over this population. And then we plot one versus another. And the hope is that uh, the value of M will be depend on the manipulation. So for example, will depend on how quick, how fast you present the material. But the relation between R and M will remain as predicted by the equation. That's one possibility. And another possibility is that this equation will not uh, be confirmed. Uh, OK, so this is the first uh, I show you that indeed it's important to measure M first, because uh, indeed M is not the universal number. It depends for a given L, for the given number of words in the list, uh, it's very important the speed of presentation. So for slower speed, there is a better uh, memory. So you, you do better at recognition test. Uh, so, so you see that even uh, for very long lists of 500, more than 500 words, uh, the best you can do on average is to recall, to remember uh, roughly half of them. But if you do a fast presentation, it drops to one fourth of them. So it's a very important factor. And of course, the number of words that you remember depends on the number of words in the list. So it's growing monotonically, the number of words in the list. And now we can do uh, uh, the experiment, the final experiment. We do recall and plot uh, R versus M. And the, there was a big surprise for us, I have to say, that. Uh, uh, all the data points uh, were very, very close to our predicted uh, equation. Right? There was no, we have this manipulation, so we manipulated the number of words in the list, we manipulated the presentation speed, so we had a large number of points, and all of them followed the uh, predicted line quite precisely, even though there were some error bars in all directions. Uh, but the uh, but the agreement was quite quite impressive, especially because you you if you think about it, there is no really a priori. We couldn't even constrain well where the results would uh, lay, right? Because you, you can say if you have a hundred words, if you don't have any idea about this uh, algorithm, how would you ever predict how many uh, words on average you recall? But only having this particular uh, algorithm can give you a, a prediction uh, that uh, out of 100 words uh, that you have in the list, uh, about 20 of them uh, can be recalled. And the results uh, predict, uh, confirm this with a very high precision. Uh, and again, we have this uh, a, a large group of subjects that did the experiment that we actually don't know who they are because we did the experiment uh, over the internet and uh, we didn't select them in any particular way so we don't know 
if they're young or old. So presumably uh, this has a, some kind of universal, uh, we suspect that they're mostly young because they, these are the people that do experiments uh, over the internet. So they're probably mostly young people, but we, we didn't select them as young. Uh, Uh, and so another uh, thing that I want to uh, show you is that you, you can now reason like that. So the, the, the experiment that we did was done with the words. Uh, but then the, the mathematical model that I presented to you is completely generic, right? It doesn't really uh, depend on what kind of information we recall, we remember and recall. <clears throat> Uh, so we want to. So we wanted to see how how far you can really uh, push the general generality of these results. Whether this is completely generic for all types of information, and the, we came up with an idea that instead of uh, doing words, we can do uh, short sentences. And this really goes back to the question that somebody asked me at the end of my previous presentation: is uh, whether uh, What's important is the like a single word or, or high level concept. So you, you can think about it as if you <coughs> have representation also for high level concepts, like sentences, then in terms of the this model, it shouldn't matter at all uh, whether uh, you present single words and sentences. So we generated a table of very short sentences that are familiar to people, right? So which express uh, very well-known facts, something like Earth is a planet, you know, th this is an example of this sentence. So you could reason that because these are very uh, known facts, so everybody knows that uh, Earth is a planet and Italy is in Europe and uh, etc. the dog barks. Uh, so we probably have some representation, uh, separate representation for this fact that is not uh, just a combination of a, of a representation of a single word. Right? So when you say that, let's say Mexico is a country, it's a separate representation, which is not just reduced to a representation of a Mexico and the representation of a country. So this means that if you, this would predict that if you have a list of these uh, sentences like this, and then you repeat all the experiments with sentences, the recall results should be exactly the same in terms of the number of sentences and not in terms of the number of words. So this means that you can recall more words, but if they're presented as part of these sentences. And this indeed worked uh, very well, very nicely as well. So we have uh, some number of data points for the sentences. So we have a, a sentence is presented uh, with some comfortable speed, which has to be lower because you have to read the whole sentence. And also the, the results for the sentences was uh, basically indistinguishable from for the results for the words. So this confirmed this generality of this uh, algorithm. So, and also it kind of confirms the fact that uh, uh, we have this uh, recording in our memory. So every uh, the information that is uh, some meaningful information that is uh, composed of a simple pieces is, is encoded uh, as one unit and not as a, as a combination of simple. Uh, what I want to, uh, if you have some questions, that's basically I want, I, I, I finished the main part of of this story. So we have this very surprising uh, result that uh, some part of the this memory process can be predicted very well <coughs> uh, by this uh, algorithmic uh, idea. And the, the main thing is that there are no free parameters to tune. So this means well, that this is presumably, question, yes. Mm -hmm. Please. Well, Question maybe comment. Uh, the algorithm looks uh, a bit uh, close to the so-called network of association. 
uh, and in the network association, it's very uh, important to, to look at the weights uh, in yeah. this, on the corresponding net, uh, network. Uh, do you consider the situation with different uh, weights or thresholds of uh, weights in the network? Uh, or you have no weights uh, in uh, the links uh, at all. Okay, so the the, mo the okay. So the the graph model, the mathematical model that I'm describing to you has no weights, right? It's already abstracted from the network. It's not a neural network model, and that's the main point because the network model has a lot of parameters. It's, not only weights, but thresholds, as you said. So what we did, uh, historically, we played around with the network models and then we just observed that no matter how you set it up, there was always a tendency for the network to make transitions according to the overlaps, right? So you, you have to set up the parameters in the right way so that the network exhibits the transitions, right? Because if you don't set it up correctly, it will just stay in one attractor and this will be. But if you set it up such that it has a transition, the, our observations were that it typically always does it in the right uh, way. So it will always go according to the overlaps, no matter how we uh, set up the parameter. So the moment we did this uh, observation, we said, okay, let's then abstract away from the network and only deal with the mathematical model. So the final mathematical model that I present to you has no weights, no thresholds. But, but it has no Actually, uh, uh, I ask about the strengths of overlaps to some extent. So you, you the strengths of overlaps are completely not important. Ah, I see. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Because the, all, it may, all, the, all that matters is the statistics of this overlaps. And the moment we say, that we just consider uh, matrices of random symmetric, random symmetric matrices, the individual strength is not important. What's important is the statistics of this. Uh, uh, as I said, you need only to know where the largest and the second largest element is. And that's what that's the only thing that's important. You can change the distribution. For example, if the generative distribution of the elements of the matrix is different, this will have no consequence for the results. Okay, you can you can sample the metric from Gaussian distribution, uniform distribution. This will not make any difference because all that matters is the rankings between the elements, which element is largest and which element is second largest. Uh, and that's a big advantage of this abstraction that we really don't have any parameters that are important. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, let me show you something. So these are the results that we published last year in the paper, so you can read it up if you're interested. I want to, like I still think I have uh, like, like 15 minutes, I want to show you a little bit of what we are, uh, some newer results. So our, uh, our motivation was that we got, uh, we wanted to see this issue of age. You know, we are all of different age. Uh, my students are young, I guess more or less of your age, I'm older. And uh, we, I noticed when doing the experiment that clearly age is a very important thing here. And uh, so we wanted to see how would you go about uh, doing this thing. So, it's difficult for us to do it because we don't know how old our subjects are. But the idea would be uh, that if you look at this equation that, uh, you know, na naively you would say, okay, so all the people just remember fewer words, right? So you would have uh, points for, with age points would just move along uh, this line. Uh, the question is, is it true or not? So can we, uh, uh can we somehow confirm this and then i started reading uh, literature about this is a huge field in psychology and especially in the memory literature there were lots of experiments uh, done specifically on young and older people 
and I, I was quite distressed because I found that uh, in, in some publications that uh, actually memory recognition, if you do recall experiments and recognition experiments, uh, recall experiments, the recall suffers more than recognition. So this is like a, a common theme in this literature is that when, when people get older, they still they they recognize the recognition is not so uh, damaged, but the recall is very much reduced. Then this would mean that uh, this may this may not be a correct um, expression for old people. Would be would mean that when 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 people get older, something works differently and think. But I I, I don't really believe that this is true. Uh, what I believe happens is that uh, it's hard to hard to estimate really for all the people uh, how many words they remember because uh, because of these issues that I mentioned that the recognition and not always give you a correct estimate of uh, how many words people remember and I actually tried it on myself uh, I try to recall uh, uh, try to recall things that I did a, a day before and uh, it, it, uh, and this is the experiment that everybody of you can do you can just try to remember what you did uh, in the morning uh, today and in the morning yesterday and there is a huge drop so there is a much better memory uh, uh, in terms of recall you can recall perfectly more or less many things that you did uh, in the morning today as opposed to the morning yesterday but if somebody reminds you, you will always uh, know what you did yesterday. So this means that recognition kind of declines uh, much slower with time than the recall. But this just means that uh, you, you cannot use recognition anymore as, a, as an estimate for the number of words that you can potentially recall. OK, I hope this is uh, not too confusing. but. We want to now to, uh, so I got some results that uh, people did on the recall of old and young uh, patients and uh, not patient subjects. And they indeed found that the recall is much better for uh, young guys. They did not do recognition at all. The question is, can we uh, do something uh, that will not uh, require of us to measure uh, M explicitly? Can we use the model? And the idea is that you can uh, go around this problem by considering the second model. So the, the, moment, the model not only predicts the average recall for a given M, so this is the average recall for a given M, but the model also predicts the spread, uh, right? Uh, so th this means that if I tell you, uh, let's say if I know that you remember 250 words, Let's say somehow I know exactly. So the model tells me that on average, let's say you recall 35 words, but also tells me what's the spread or the second moment of the variance or the standard deviation. Okay, and I'll show you a bit later what are the mathematical expressions. Okay, so let's... Uh, uh, just to illustrate, so let's say in the random graph model, this is uh, easier because this is an exact result. I, I showed you that in the random graph model, there is an exact result which uh, says that the second moment of recall is related to the first moment and the number of words that you remember. Okay, so this means that if you do uh, the experiments on the large number of people, that all uh, remember the same number of words, you don't really know, need to know what this number of words, because you can uh, use these two equations. This is the equation for the first moment. This is the relation between the second and the first moment. You can use this equation to express M versus R, right? It's a simple algebra and then put it back in the first equation. And then you have this uh, universal a relation between the second and the first moment. Okay, so this is a very uh, uh, helpful thing because this means that I don't need to know what M is. 
as long as I somehow know that uh, all my subjects remember the same number of words, uh, I can, uh, this is the uh, relation that should be valid between the second and the first moment. So the first, the second moment has to be a quadratic uh, uh, expression of the first moment with a very precise value for the coefficients, especially like the coefficient for for the for the uh, quadratic term has to be exactly four over two. Okay, now this is a uh, this is a in, in the real situation this will be a lower bound because this this is the second moment assuming that all of the people remember exactly the same number of words. Of course, people cannot remember the same number of words, so uh, different people will remember different number of words. So this will be a lower number, lower bound for the second moment, and you can actually compute the upper bound. The upper bound uh, can be computed if you assume that uh, people are divided into group two groups. Some people remember no words at all, so they are just not paying attention, and some people remember the the, the total number, all words, and this will be the 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 maximum value. And then you can also compute the upper. So you can, uh, without doing any experiment on M, so any recognition experiment, you can place the bound uh, on the second moment as, a, as expressed on the first. And you can see, uh, and uh, uh, with, without doing any recognition experiments. And the same thing you can do uh, for the uh, matrix, for the model with the symmetric matrix. So the, you have this uh, different relation. So this is now, uh, we found the, uh, uh, I don't yet know how to calculate these coefficients exactly, but uh, numerically you can easily calculate this equation. So again, you can use this uh, two equations and then you can put the lower bound on the second moment, which again has to be given by the quadratic form with the, the same coefficient four over pi uh, for the quadratic term. So this can now, so we can now reanalyze uh, re our experiment by looking at the second moment and the first moment and see what we, what do we get. So we 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 need to see that this uh, uh, expression gives you a lower bound, and we can also have a higher bound that I will show you. And then we can also look at the data for young and, and old subjects and see where where this data is. So this are. Uh, so we have uh, this uh, uh, colored uh, circles. Uh, this is our data. So if you look first at the colored surface, you see that indeed for every number of words, you have a lower bound, which is the universal lower bound for the whole thing. This is this parabolic uh, uh, line. And for every value of uh, M, you have also an upper bound, which turns out to be a straight line that connects the, the two extreme points on this, uh, uh, on this parabolic line. So for example, if you have uh, 256 words uh, that you present, uh, so the largest possible uh, uh, the best situation will be if every all, all the subjects remember all the words. So in this case, the average number of words recalled will be 35. We can exactly predict uh, the second moment. There will be some, some particular value of the second moment. And uh, all the intermediate situations have to be between this uh, red parabola and the uh, straight line of the corresponding color. And the closer the point are to, to the parabola, the more uniform uh, the, the people are in terms of them. Okay, so you see, like if you just look at this data, you see that for short list uh, data are indeed becoming closer to the parabola, which means that for short list people remember these uh, words well and more uniformly. For longer list, the data deviates uh, uh, away from the parabola, it's always above as it should be, and it never crosses the upper bound. Corresponding upper bound. So now, if we zoom, uh, so the interesting thing that I want to show you now is the new data that I uh, took from the literature for uh, young and old subjects that are doing. Uh, uh, it's not here. 
So uh, let me show you a MATLAB file because then I can uh, zoom in. So this is the same graph, but now I can zoom in to where I want. So again, the uh, colored uh, 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 spots is uh, uh, just re uh, represent the reanalysis re of our data that I showed you before. But let's look now, this is the data set, the two data sets that I took from the literature, uh, where people did the uh, lab experiments. They showed the uh, list of 16 words to people, either young people or uh, old people. And they compared their recall performance. And as I said, the observation was that on average, uh, young people recall more words than uh, old. Right, so the result that present in this paper is that young people, on average, <coughs> recall uh, somewhere between eight and nine words out of sixteen, and uh, old people uh, recall uh, somewhere after uh, something above six. So th there is a gap of two words on the average between young and old people. Old people here were 70, I think, and above, and young people were students. So if you just have these two uh, data points, so if you just say, okay, so we have six and eight, this of course tells us nothing about whether they use the same algorithm or not, right? And this is what the question that I, I want to answer because that's, I think, a fundamental question, whether old people and young people use the same uh, algorithm, the same process for recall, and the, the difference is explained uh, by their uh, worth uh, memory. So the, the number of words that they recall is, they remember is less, that they can remember efficiently is less, or <clears throat> they use different algorithms, different processes. So the interesting thing is that if you look at the now at the second moment, and this is the most surprising result. So these are the young people that recall, uh, that remember 16 words. And these are students that do the experiments in the lab. So you see that in fact, their performance is at the exactly the best performance that you can expect uh, for, for 16 words, right? You cannot, if, if the model is correct, this is the best that the model can do. This means that uh, these young guys who do the experiment with 16 words, they actually, all of them remember all 16 words because they are highly practiced uh, students. So they, and they have a motivation because they sit in the lab. So they, uh, and, and, and if you see that, if you look at the second moment, so the, the spread or the, the second moment of the performance, that's exactly what the model predicts. So this is a really very, precise the prediction that we, we not only know uh, how what's the best performance in terms of the average that you can expect, but they exactly the, the distribution has exactly the same uh, spread as we predict from the model. <clears throat> the older people presumably recall fewer words and they, they are a little bit above this red line but they're still close to the line. So it still means that even the older people, I, I think my interpretation at least of this data is that the older people remember fewer words, but the second moment is a, a bit above of what you predict. So it means that there is some spread now between people. So you can recalculate this and, and it seems that on average they recall uh, about uh, uh, 12, 14 words, between 12 and 14 words, but with a small spread. So that's why this data point has a bit higher variance than what we would predict from uniform uh, memory, but still overall, it's on the same uh, line. So, so my interpretation is that all the people uh, remember fewer words and the, 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 so they have a worse representations of words in memory. But then when they go about and recording these words, they more or less use the same algorithm. So this, of course, still preliminary results and we trying to think of uh, how to 
how to make it more precise, how to do experiments in a better way. But this is uh, some intermediate uh, uh, result that I wanted to show to show you. And I think I, I stop here. So this is. Uh, okay. I thank okay. you again for your for listening. And if you have some more questions, please ask me.